people think that when you commit to another, that what it means is you're not seeing anyone else. You know, like in the dating world, it's like, okay, well, we're going to commit to each other. That means there's no one else. It's like, no, actually the not sleeping with anyone else is the easy part. The committing to the practices that actually help create a relationship. That's the work. Welcome to the Inspired Evolution, and it is such a treat to be here today. We have with us Jillian Tarecki. Jillian, how are you today? I'm doing well. That was I love that little yeehaw on the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> you start every podcast that way. Yeah, every single podcast starts it. this way, and uh, it's a yeehaw, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's probably the Aussie version of the American yeehaw. So yeah, I was gonna uh, say it probably <laughs> actually is synonymous with that. So, uh, yep, every podcast starts that way, despite whoever's on the other side. And I've had some moments where I'm like, "Am I really gonna you today?" Like, um, yeah, but every 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 single episode, every single episode. Love it. Love it. <laughs> For those tuning into Jillian for the first time, let me give you do the honors for a quick sec. She's a certified uh, relationship coach, but she's actually been teaching and writing on this for like 20 years. She's taught others how to transform their relationship with others, but fundamentally uh, themselves. Podcast on love, definitely worth checking out. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for sharing this. And uh, yeah, I guess we've had a few people on Jillian before um, on the topic of relationships and it consistently seems to be this theme and maybe it's the inspired evolution and the vibe and like the depths of sort of the spiritual exploration around life that we go into that we come back to this conversation that actually our relationship with ourselves is fundamentally what underpins our relationship with others. Is that your awareness on that? Can you share a little bit about that, about your awareness on that? Well, yeah. So basically, so even the the choices that we make in partners will reflect how we feel about ourselves. Mm. Um, When we want to, when we're in a relationship and we want to improve the relationship in any way, it will always point to us improving our relationship with ourselves because- Mm -hmm you know, even just to learn how to communicate better. So much of learning how to communicate better is learning how to transcend our egos in many ways and transcend our fears and transcend wounds that have been with us for decades. So we will always, a relationship will always demand that we um, look, take a look at ourselves. And not only that, so much what so much of what can drive a relationship to um not necessarily to dysfunction although it can but for two people to lose connection with one another is when we've lost some sort of connection to ourselves so the first step would always be to stay connected with ourselves and then to bring that elevated energy into a relationship but most of us not you know many of us once we're getting into a relationship we get comfortable and so we're not taking care of ourselves in the same way or we are um yeah we're not taking care of ourselves in the same way so i think that the relationship that we have with ourselves is is fundamental to everything mm. A little bit of a stickier question because most of what I also found with Inspired Evolution is oftentimes what we start, we share with the world, the the archetype of the wounded healer is a really prevalent one. Um, And especially those that are in such deep surface, like you are, have tuned into your work and you really share so much of what's in your own heart. I guess an opportunity for us to connect with, like, how is this reflected in your own journey? Um, was there, a, like, your own journey with relationships? Like, was there a certain point where you were going through what felt like a real challenge and then you've had to really come home to yourself? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the I think everyone who is um, incredibly motivated to help others began with, 
a struggle internally that they have worked or tried to work on in themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that that's, I really think that's the story for anyone who Mm -hmm. wants to um, help others. But yeah, I, this definitely, I mean, I started off my whole relationship to this started off with my relationship with yoga. I discovered yoga 23 years ago, 23 or 24 years ago. And, um, and it was like the light at the end of a, of a tunnel. It was just, it was a beautiful thing for me. It's really what helped me, um, heal a lot of, uh, whatever the, the usual agitation that we experience in our minds. And it was, it was just, it was through, I've always been active, but it was through yoga and the practice of yoga that I was really able to tune into myself and my thought patterns and my behavior in a way that I hadn't encountered before. Hmm. Um, And then, you know, and so I spent many years working with people using their body as the vehicle to to help them understand their minds and their psychologies and their emotions and i dealt with a lot of people who were dealing with a lot of emotional stuff but i would help them through this practice of yoga Mm -hmm. and then it was just really the the catalyst of moving this into relationship coaching was the was the failure of my marriage many years ago and me waking up and, and then there was that, and my mom was dying. So it was a lot of, I, it was like a a real catastrophe in my life Mm. where I were so many things were ending. And I thought, how could this be happening? Something is wrong. Mm. You know, something is wrong. Something I'm doing is wrong. And so it was really in an effort to feel better and to get out of pain that I went on this journey and, And inside of this journey, I quickly discovered that I had to help others in their own journey as well. Mm -hmm. And specifically when it came to, I mean, all relationships, but most specifically romantic relationships, because it's romantic relationships where we get triggered the most. Mm -hmm. It's romantic, you know, we could have, everything could be going well in our lives, everything. But if our relationship doesn't feel right yeah. or stressful, we're not going to be happy. Yeah. We're just I, not. I I relate to that. It's um yeah. you know, it's almost like when your partner's compass feels off or they're having a shitty day, it's 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 hard to have a good day yourself when your partner's mm-hmm. having a shitty day. So even just that yeah. as a baseline awareness. And thank you so much for sharing your own your own story and journey in there. Um yeah. I, there's a bit where you mentioned is there something like there's something that I am doing that you know is off and I think that piece there is the not so obvious piece I think yes. generally when we're in relationships you know it's it's so much easier to point a finger <laughs> in the other direction it's like could you just or would you just or just you know for I was going to say for fuck's sake. <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, but that, that awareness, you know, when you're going through something so seismic and I think I can see, you know, having that yogic philosophy behind you and I'm like, well, like something I am doing, you know, as the creator of my reality is, is, is yeah. off here. What are the, the key chat, like having done this for 20 years, are there like, two or three big key challenges that you see um, again and again that sort of inhibit harmonious and thriving romantic relationships? Um, Yes. So number one is stress and not so much stress, but how we respond to the stress in our lives. Stress response. Yeah. Is, is the number one thing that I see um, couples struggle with so is this stress it, between each other or is this no life stress it's, it's not general? even that's, no it's just life stress it's not mm. it's not coping with the demands the everyday demands of mm. our lives well and letting negativity and overwhelmment take over to the point where we get into this very particular state and we bring that state into the relationship 
and um, it's no longer thriving. I mean, if you think about who you are in the beginning of a relationship, you know, mm. we there's a saying that we bring our A game right at the mm. very beginning relationship we're kind of like <laughs> right you meet our ambassador <laughs> you don't yes, meet us. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then of course exactly and then life gets in the way and of course there's many you know we talked about before you started this podcast we we talked about there's many seasons right and there's mm. many seasons to our lives and sometimes we're going to go through really hard times and really trying times but it's like I said, it's how we react to the demands of our daily lives. And then people mm -hmm. come into their relationship and they're like, you know, they, they get stuck in an emotional pattern that was there before the relationship. And they're just basically like, well, you know, I'm stressed out. I'm overwhelmed. And when we get very stressed out and overwhelmed, we get incredibly self-consumed. Mm -hmm. everything becomes about us and our problems. And then what happens is we sort of disengage from the relationship unknowingly. Mm. And, and then you take two people who are just consumed with their problems and their stress. And then, you know, days, weeks, months, years go by. And then all of a sudden that couple wakes up and they're like, we are totally disconnected. So number one, it really, it really is stress. It's how, it is our emotional sort of baseline and mm. how we deal with, just like I said, the everyday demands of life and how we let it steal our own joy. Mm. And then we, and then, and then you are in a relationship joyless, not necessarily because of the other person. And then the second thing, which is. Sorry, related, just, just, just before yeah. you jump into the second yeah. thing. Sorry, sorry, just to jump in. I, this yeah, is. Yeah huge is it worth in that space then the space for sharing our problems with each other then like do we have like is there a value in that because sometimes I've, I've met some people that are like you know I leave my work at work and then I come home and I and I try to like connect from a completely empty slate yeah and you know when you say time pressures often of like parenting there's a lot of stuff but work is a big part of a lot of people's life right so from there they come home and some people have advocated sort of just wiping like leaving work at work coming home and just connecting from a whole nother space but then sometimes i wonder if they're sort of bottling up all their work stuff and they're not being able to connect and leave all that stress sort of at work but then there's still the stress may still be in their head no think, no not necessarily yeah. not hmm. necessarily i think that it's actually a very good practice to you know, life is all about transition. So if you are spending your day in one mode, like work mode, mm. and then you, you do some, you have some sort of ritual, whether it's something that you say to yourself, whether it's a walk you take, whether it's the gym that you go to, whether it's the bath that you take when you're home, some mm. sort of transition when you're like, when I'm home, I'm not I'm not wearing the hat that I wore all day at work. I'm mm. stepping into partner role. I'm stepping into, into fatherhood. Role. Yeah. Yeah. yeah or fatherhood or motherhood. So I think that that's really, really important. Mm. Um, obviously if there's something really going on at work or something going on in your life, that has nothing to do with work. That's very troubling. I think it's, yeah, I think it's very important when you're in a relationship, you should be able to share with each mm. other, like what's bothering you. That's, different than every day complaining about the same thing that's not even a big deal right it's like mm. making it's like creating mountains out of mohills that those are two very different um situations i know we're still in the middle of point one and you've got three point like two or three points to cover but i have to go on this tangent with you because yeah, yeah. i heard you what? say complaining is a passion killer can you describe that sentiment yeah. like you were talking about yeah. inventing is a turn off like this is something when i came across your work i was like oh <laughs> it makes a lot of sense when i heard it said by you out loud but i never identified it as a piece of wisdom yeah well it also depends on who you're in a relationship with like women mm -hmm. we really do need to get things off our chest and to vent mm -hmm. because we feel things really, really, really deeply, and it helps mm. us to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, you know, if you're in a relationship and you want to vent, 
it's important to say, you know what, I really need to vent. Mm. Are like, are you open to listening to me for like 10 minutes while I vent about something? And if you're in a relationship with someone who likes to fix and to give suggestions, then you can just say, I really need to vent. I don't need you to fix anything. I don't even need your advice. I just need to like get it off my chest. And maybe I just need a hug afterwards. Mm. So that's the way that you communicate. That's very different than, you know, being mindless and unconscious in a relationship and constantly complaining and, and, and venting. Yeah. That is a passion killer. Who wants to be around a constant complainer, Mm. right? Because it's just, that's just not attractive at Mm. all. I mean, but that's very different than saying, you know, there's something that's really bothering me and I really need to get it off my chest. Mm. Two very different things. I love that. And I promise I will let you <laughs> speak to the No, this point. is important. Yeah, I yeah. think um, well, uh, I'm reminded of this study that I was uh, exposed to by um, Daniel Goleman. We had him on the podcast on emotional intelligence, um, really fascinating author. And he talks about, he get, he, he shared this, he, he was investigating this study and he shared it with me was they had a couple of um, uh I'm going to paraphrase it and probably butcher it and hopefully not too <laughs> not too badly <laughs> um, as I do this. But they mm-hmm. had um, two groups of people and they had the example was these were both um, parish students. Like they were both from the study, like students in the church basically. And they were both told two groups and each was told a, uh, like a Bible story. One group was told the uh, the Good Samaritan Bible story. Um, of helping somebody on their way, and someone, and the others were just told a like a re- like a random Bible story, and then they were set to a particular task <coughs> to go from A to B, and on their way from A to B, there was, they pl- the the study was they had planted somebody on the way to actually need some help, and the study was investigating whether they had heard the Samaritan story, would they likely stop to help because that was what was replaying in their head or whether it didn't matter what story they, they were told prior to, you know, going to, you know, in, in like into like they ended up interfacing with this person that needed help, whether that impacted their journey. And what the study actually found was I, th- I would have imagined that, you know, if you're having heard the story of the Good Samaritan and being replaying in your head and it's kind of like front and centre in your in your mind that when you get out there, like, and you see someone else, oh, yeah, I've just been researching, oh, this is an opportunity to be that guy. Like, I could help, you know. But they found that actually, no, like, it made no difference whether what you'd been consuming slash listening to, what made the difference was how much time pressure you felt like you were under. Mm. And that was the that was the only factor that they could espouse was like it's all about time pressure. And if they felt like they had the time, everybody's innately good. But if they didn't feel like they had the time, they would just breeze past and be like, "Oh, that's somebody else's problem." And that's what I'm hearing you saying as well in terms of like the stress in our life. Like if we could just slow down and like learn to modulate our stress, we can actually drop in and be better people in our relationships. Yeah. So basically, when yeah, absolutely. So. When we are like stress is a part of life mm. and cer- and there are certain things that happen in life that are incredibly stressful. But when just talking about the everyday demands of life, mm-hmm. we're either f- facing them or mm-hmm. we are completely getting dysregulated by them. Mm. And people will, we, we lose sight all the time, myself included, of what's really important. And we stress the small stuff. And the most important thing that I'm really trying to say is that when we get stressed, we get in our heads. When we get in our heads, we are not connected. We're not connected to our bodies. We're not connected to our hearts. We are not connected to our partner, Mm. period. And then when we are under stress, we are much more susceptible to creating all sorts of fiction in our minds. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, we see the glass half empty and we're seeing we're seeing our partner in a specific light. We're seeing ourselves in a particular light. So the first thing is to learn how to, yes, manage our stress or everyday stress better so mm. that we can feel more like ourselves Mm-mm. and show up more like ourselves 
in a relationship. And I'm telling you, guaranteed, the number one thing that I see that 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 sabotages the relationships that I have worked with, people I've worked with, has been this. Mm. Is there a a low hanging fruit that we can sort of pick at? So, like you know, you mentioned a bath. You mentioned you know like taking some time, like just like, you know, stopping before you come like to the gym, before you come home, like self-care. Like I can see a lot of these are like coming back. Yeah, it's every day. Exer- exercise, meditate. Exercise, exercise, meditate. Meditate. Do thing. do things, do things that make you happy. Mm. <laughs> that make you happy. Um, we get so like, it's, it's actually really that simple. Do it things doesn't that have to be more and complicated. Also, and, and build up the habit of, appreciating what is rather than always looking for what's missing. Mm. This is not, I mean, it's simple, but it's not easy. Cause again, we get bogged down and there's so many, there's so many layers to this. It's like, if someone is having a lot of work stress, mm. it's not necessarily what's we think, Oh, they're having a lot of work stress. Something must be happening in the office. Mm. Mm. Yes. That's, of course, that's possible, but that's not where one should go to first. Usually when we're having a lot of work stress, it's because of an internal conflict that says, I'm not succeeding at the level that I'm supposed to be succeeding at. I'm not making enough money. I'm not, I'm not where I should be. Mm. Right. So it has to do with bringing this full circle to our relationship with ourselves. Mm. Most stress, not all stress, most stress that we're we're tripping out over on a daily basis has less to do with the circumstance and has more to do with an internal conflict that we are facing that the circumstance is triggering inside of us mm. that you know if i'm not i'm not achieving at the level i should be achieving at because mom and dad told me you know expected this or society expected this or i've put this pressure on myself I mean, why do you think, you know, how many, how many people, men in particular, have killed themselves during market crashes? That that's not the market crash. That's mm. because they've it, they've tied their entire worth to mm. how much they make. And as soon as it's gone, they feel worthless and hence kill themselves. I'm just using that as 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 an example, but mm-hmm. you know. It's, it's not just men, it's women, it's, it's all of us, Mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, it's the beliefs that we have that, that, that say that we're not good enough or that we're not worthy. That's what creates the tremendous amount of stress. So yes, we have to be mitigating our, our, the daily stress of our lives by releasing it through our bodies and meditation. But if it's something that's like a, like a disease that, that keeps infiltrating your life and your relationship, then it might be, okay, let's look deeper into why you're so off, like what's going Mm. on. And usually what you'll uncover is a belief system that has made it so that person's worthiness is tied to whatever's happening. And so they Mm. feel out of control, Mm. right? So this is why the relationship we have with ourselves is so important. Mm. And the low hanging fruit is really the stress. The stress is the clue that something is lurking beneath the surface inside of us that needs addressing. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. I um, have often found myself saying that I'm a big fan of stress and people go, what? And I'm like, because stress is like the, the, it's like a free life coach in your life. It's like letting you know that, Hey, something's up, something's going wrong. And we need some stress to be motivated. (laughs) Yeah. It's a a sort of big umbrella, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so point two, then what is the second biggest challenge that you find, um, stress being this major one? Yeah. Yeah. That's really, I mean, that's the biggest one. I mean, um, and then the second one, maybe it's not so obvious is that people don't have, we were never taught in school how to communicate, Mm. you know, so how to communicate. So what we do is, um, 
We don't share what it is that we need. We don't share what it is that we want. We grow resentful. Mm -hmm. And then there's this big fat elephant sitting in the room between two people and it's not being addressed. So we don't, we haven't learned how to really tell the truth um, and to tell it well Mm. in a relationship. So communication or lack of communication um, is huge. Yeah. I find um, even with communication, it can sound so, there's so many layers to that piece though, really, um, because it can just sound like, oh, we don't talk about, you know, what's come up or how we're feeling and, you know, X, Y, and Z. Um, but a lot changed in my own relationship when I read this book called Nonviolent Communication. Have you come yes. across this yeah. body of work? Sure. Yeah. yeah. And it's been... Um, it was profound because for me, the the invitation was like, hey, I need, well, you know, expressing things in a way that actually what, like by own term, like ending your sort of communication piece with what your actual needs were and why you're requesting what you're requesting as one of the pieces of work, which was just like half the time I didn't need what I was asking for. And the other half of the time was like, oh, like I've actually got this need and I'm trying to get, you to fulfill it um as a as a request and it was like oh wow like actually can i meet that need myself was this whole question that started to emerge so my relationship with myself started to shift as i started looking into nonviolent communication which is a very interesting sort of terminology nonviolent communication for those tuning in they're going to be like oh, i'm not violent in my communication i don't need this but actually it was really really profound in terms of because we're always communicating to ourselves. We're always communicating to the other. Even like if I was just, just to sit here in silent, there's a communication that's happening between you and me, right? Like, oh yeah, we're, it's, it's not just verbal. We're communicating all the time with our bodies. We're communicating all the time by even the things that are left unsaid. Mm, yeah. And that can be a big thing in relationships as well, right? Like not speaking our needs, not asking for, for what we want. Um, but then also not necessarily like sometimes I guess not even knowing what our needs are in the first place. Mm -hmm. Do you find that for people? Like they, they may not necessarily be aware of what they actually need. They know that they've been saying certain things and going through certain patterns of behavior, trying to espouse or, you know, receive something from the other person, but not actually understanding what is the underlying need for them in their community and why and how they're communicating that? I think what I find more is that people will feel insignificant and unseen to the person who they're in a relationship with, but they don't, they don't know how to ask for what it is that they want clearly and resolutely and everyone has a different struggle when it comes to relationships i work with a lot of women who um were never taught the skill of how to assert themselves in a relationship Mm. and so that you know teaching someone how to assert themselves in a relationship is really important but also uh, i also work with people who every time they ask for what they want everything is about blaming, right? So there's a whole art to communication that we're not taught in school. And I love that book, Nonviolent Communication. Um, But so, yeah, so yes, some people, the, the, what I find more is that people don't know what their partner needs. And Sure, it is our responsibility in a relationship to say what our needs are, but it's also our responsibility to be observant mm. and to and to as we get to know the person we're in a relationship with to to also know some of the things that they need, you know, because we have to understand each other's psychology. And, and part of understanding each other's psychology is, yes, we share about ourselves, we open up about ourselves. But like I said, we have to be equally observant. Like if you've been in a, like, you know, there are certain things that you know about your wife and that would make her happy 
that mm. she hasn't necessarily, I would bet, I'm asking you, that she hasn't necessarily spelled out for you, but you know, because you've been in relationship with her and you've been paying attention. Is that true? Yeah, there's a handful of things actually that come to mind immediately. She's, um, recently I started studying this whole body of work around the mood cure um, for supplementation for actually supporting your, your mental well-being, And she was just feeling a bit beaten down at work. And I was just like, yeah, I'm going to start this protocol on myself to sort of see how I go and use myself as a guinea pig to sort of see if it would support her. And she's on it now and she's loving it. Um, but even other things like she, she loves holidays and becoming a mum can be super routine. And we've got a 16 month old baby. So routines really come into her life. And she mentioned actually a few times, she's like, you know, I would love to go away on a holiday, but it just didn't happen because it was too hard. And I started noticing that actually this is not, something that is just a I'd be nice to go away on a holiday actually it, this is something that she really needs like it'd be mm. really good for us to take a break because how like my days I'm feeling a routine and honest but I'm the father and I still have you know this podcast for example you know every like every episode's different so there's some sort of creative exploration but for her it's you know everything is super routine so dropping in and going actually, I'm just going to book two holidays. <laughs> doesn't matter how far off they are. At least they're on our calendar, on our horizon. And then little things like she loves massages. So, and luckily I'm touch wood pretty good with my hands. So that helps as well. Um, but yeah, little yeah, things like that. That's you being a very good husband. That's you being a really good partner because that's right, yeah. he didn't say to you, honey, what I need is a break. What I need is a vacation. And then you said, okay, let's do this, which would be great. Mm. I'm not saying that that's, that would be bad. That's wonderful. Sometimes we do have to say that. But the fact that you were tuned in, you were paying attention mm. and you know her, you know, she's someone who likes variety, who mm. doesn't want to just be in routine. You see that that's all routine. So you, you were proactive and you did something that, I mean, that's, that's how you make yourself very valuable as a partner. Mm. Mm. And we have to really pay attention in a relationship. And, and we become less relevant to the person we're in a relationship with when we're not paying attention. Thank you for that piece. What's emerging for me in there is sometimes I wonder if I'm just wired differently to others. And this is a bit of a vulnerable sort of me taking a moment to get coached by you almost <laughs> um, but in here i have sometimes wonder if i'm wired differently or whether this is a collective thing and with your experience maybe we can have a look at it because i find it sounds so selfless when you describe it the way you've described it. it's like i've taken the time to be observant and etc 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 and it sounds you know it, it at the risk of it runs the risk of putting me on a pedestal but my honest truth is that my life is better when she's better. Mm -hmm. Touch wood, yeah. you know. So as much as it sounds like, you know, oh, how nice Amrit's thinking of her and, you know, and it's like, yes, that, that bit exists. It totally does, yeah, but it's not what's driving it. It's not 80% of the pie. That's like 20% of the pie for me. 80% of it is like this is my, my person and my life is better when my person's better, you know? And but it's you're almost... saying this, the exact same thing. No, it's the exact same thing. So why is your life better when your wife is happy? Or I think because I see us, Touchwood, as a as a unit. Like I see us as as a team. I see us as yeah. like, you know, two wings to one bird almost. Yeah. Right? Like I don't really see it as yeah, Touchwood. The relationship. Of course, your relationship is going to be better when both of you are happier and, mm. and getting your needs met. Mm -hmm. So, so why, why, while I understand and, you know, respect your humility, you know, I know, look, you're not perfect. None of us are perfect, but that is something that you did. That was, it's important for me to point it out at least that that is, that's good. That's you tuning in. Yeah. You did it because it would make her happier. Her being happier makes you happier. It makes the relationship better. Yeah. Because when we do something for our partner, we're not just doing it for them. We're doing it for the good of the relationship. And what's good for the relationship is that people are happy. 
See, that makes so much sense. But sorry, I'll just take this example and blow it out yeah. to, you know, what I've what I've experienced. So there was a point in my wife's career, and I'm probably starting to run the risk of ever sharing her story now. She'll like flip. But anyway, <laughs> um, but not but anyway, I know she'll be okay with this piece. Um, she she had an existential crisis. She's, you know, and she basically went like, you know, I think we all have this around Saturn's return at the age of 27, 28, 29, 30. Everyone's like, you know, what is really my, my passion and purpose in life? And so yeah. she went on this journey. She was like, hey, I can feel the call to travel. I need to. And she was like, I, I feel like I want to just go travel. And I was like, go. And she's like, would you come with me? And I was like, is this for you or is this for me? And she's like, it's for me. And I was like, do you think you get more traveling yourself? And she's like, yeah, I think it's a, it's meant to be a journey for me. And we'd been in this relationship, touch wood, for six years at that time. And long story short, you know, uh, well, her parents were like, oh, yeah, just check with check with Amrit, hoping that I would sort of be <laughs> like the ones like, no, you can't leave. Like, how could you leave me? How long are you going for? Whatever. And I was like, yeah. But I was like, and this is what I was saying before, so I was like, go. And she was like, what? And I was like, absolutely go. Like, if you're feeling like your cup is empty and you feel like this thing is going to fill up your cup, out you go. <laughs> you know, like, go fill up your cup, do your thing. And people, I still remember just the looks people gave me and the conversations people consistently kept having with me all throughout that period. And it was like, I would say, 10% of my community and my community is pretty switched on like in terms of like spiritually, like, you know, quite, mm -hmm. quite aware, like the lights are on, um, touch wood. But even then people would come up and be like, so your wife's on a beach in Brazil. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, you're here. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, she could be meeting anybody over there doing anything. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, and what you trust her and i was like it's not so much about trust like you know she's not feeling like her life is serving her right now and she knows that she needs to go do this thing like just from a completely selfish perspective that's my person maybe that's the commitment piece that i made early on that makes me feel like that's my person and i want that per like if that's the other half of me touch wood like i want that other half to be full and just from that selfish perspective, it's like, yeah, I want that person to go do whatever they need to be as full as they can so that when they come home, it's full, right? But I remember how people would interface and interact. And like, they couldn't believe that I was doing something. Like, and do you know when she's coming home? And I'm like, no. And they're like, dude. And people looked at me like, oh, some sort of Samaritan or some shit. And I was like, dude, I'm not. I it's it's selfish. Like I'm coming from a selfish place. It's, it's not selfish. It's it's <laughs> It's, well, it's 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 actually very generous and also wise. It was smart because you also know because there was a part of you that knew that if you said no, mm. that she, I, I don't think it's I think it's both. I think if you said no, then then you do wouldn't want to see her unhappy, and that her saying and then saying no wouldn't be good for you and for the relationship. But I think so a lot of people not... expected that, right? Like a lot of people expect to be able to be like, oh, I want to go do this, and the other person goes, oh, no, that doesn't work for me, and then the other person stifles yeah, because themselves because they're scared. So, so you had been together six years prior to this, mm, yep, and yep. and you had a secure relationship, like you felt safe with her, she felt safe with you. Touch wood, yeah, yeah. So. You trusted her mm. and you trust and you didn't just trust her to not meet someone on the beach. You trusted that when she would come back, mm. she would still love you. Mm. Was there a part of you that's that that worried that she would come back different and not want to be with you? No. Nah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Touch <laughs> exactly. Touch so that's, that wasn't yeah. even. So the only was, reason uh, why people don't quote unquote, get on board or allow their partner to do that is because mm. they're, this is the real selfish piece, but I understand it. They're afraid that that person, they'll lose the person. I mean, there were moments that, you know, that thought crossed my mind, but the piece of wisdom that was like, the piece of wisdom that also, yeah, like the mind obviously has, and the ego has its fears, like, 
and the piece was that if it was meant for me, it's always going to come back to me. If it's not mine, it, if it doesn't come back, it was never mine anyway. You know that piece. Well, of, that's the belief system that saved your ass in that moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people will will say that have that belief system, but when it comes, like if they're if you know, you had a you had a stable, loving relationship where you felt really secure. Touch wood. Yeah. Um. If there's any, if there were any ruptures to that relationship, if you felt insecure, you know, it may have been a different story, but that's why people don't want the person to go ahead and have that, that journey is because they're afraid that that journey is just going to keep going away and so keep going. Yeah. And so to bring this back to your point, it's the the observation piece and like actually like we were talking about communication. It's like actually part of it is observing the other and actually being aware of what their needs are. And, you know, that's a communication that they've got in their life as well. It's like, hey, like this is what's coming up for me. And, you know, they may not be saying it physically. You might be able to see like, you know, they take an hour to decompress every day when they get home or, you know, that, you know, they haven't been out, you know, they don't interact with the dog or the, or the children the way that they used to, you know, and so picking up on those comms pieces and being observant and then, you know, potentially even getting out of our own way to allow them to, to get what they need out of the relationship and not let our fears run that. Um, yes. yeah, 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 absolutely. Touch wood. Awesome. Is there another point? I was just look, seeking three. <laughs> we got know, stress, wait, we got the original question, the three um, things that are. are the, yeah, what are the three <laughs> big key challenges to romantic relationships that inhibit sort of harmony and thriving? Yeah. So, right. So it's, it's the stress and it's how we're relating to stress, which always goes mm-hmm. back to a deeper, a deeper layer within ourselves. There's mm-hmm. the communication or the lack of, mm-hmm. and we covered, you know, how in, there are some people who don't assert themselves. There are some people who are not paying attention to the other. There's not, there's not the, there's the lack of attunement to their partner. So your partner is communicating to you things all the time, but mm. non-verbally, are you picking up, you know? And I think that, you know, since you brought up selfishness, I think selfishness is often a, um, is really the the third thing that I see people struggle with in relationship. They think um, everything is about their needs, what they're getting, what they're not getting, mm. and not paying attention to what their partner needs or, or not. Now we're talking about couples. We're not talking about, you know, the problems that I see in individuals in their love lives, because that's a whole mm. different conversation that mm. maybe we'll get to after this. But when it comes to people in, because I, I coach a fair amount of people who are single and really struggle in that area of their life. But when mm. we're talking about couples, yeah, it's the, it's the constant, what am I not getting? And never, and not actually considering what is, what is it that I'm not giving mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that selfishness. And you don't have to be a selfish person to, to become selfish in a relationship. You know, as soon as we're scared or we feel insecure, whether that insecurity is something that has nothing to do with the other person or everything to do with the other person, we go into fight or flight and we go into survival mode. And as soon as we're in survival mode, we, everything becomes about self-protection. And so we don't even care about giving. We're just all about, you know, my needs being met. And uh, we become very, very selfish when we're in survival mode. We don't, because we just don't know how we, we tap into a lower part of ourselves and to get into our higher minds is to, is to say, okay, well, if I'm feeling really insecure, if I'm not feeling good in this relationship, they must not be feeling good. Now, obviously we're not addressing abuse or anything like that. We're talking about a relationship in which two people love each other. They want Mm. it to work, but they're struggling. And usually what happens is other than the, the two former things that we discussed is, Oh, I'm not happy. They must not be happy either. How have I been as a partner, because I have sure been 
evaluating them as a partner. And I've been talking to my parents about it, <laughs> talking to my friends about it. I've been talking to my sister about it. I'm talking about all the ways in which- And my not. dog. I talked to my dog about it. I talked to my dog about it. I'm talking to God about it. I'm talking to whatever about how they're not showing up. And we, and then, but it's like, well, how am I showing up? That's what I see. Have I been loving? To get really real with ourselves in terms of turning the lens back inwards. Super, super, super honest with ourselves. It's always about telling the truth to ourselves and to the other. And it's not easy. Even um, what you mentioned before at the beginning in your first response was, you know, there's so much that um, we can see, like, you know, from even just the partner that we choose right, in terms of what our needs, what we're telling ourselves or what needs we're sort of hiding from and what we're, what we're expressing, right? Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that a little bit? Like, Wait, can you, can you ask that again? I don't think I totally understood the question. Okay, so like, you was, like in there you were saying, you know, like the, the piece around self and out turning the lens back inwards in terms of what we need, right, in terms of like where am I not showing up more loving, right, as, as, as the potential conversation instead of like, you know, this person's not giving me. And it's like actually what am I not giving, <laughs> right? Um, there's this whole opportunity for us to go, oh, yep, like, you know, what am I receiving? Like well, even in the conversation of what am I giving and receiving, it's like the partner you've chosen is this whole opportunity for you to reflect upon within yourself as well, right, like this whole Ah, oh, like I had certain needs of X, Y, and Z, and this person's really good at giving X, Y, and Z, or this person has the needs of receiving X, Y, and Z, and I'm really good at giving X, Y, and Z, right? Like we do we do you see that sort of I don't want to say male, female sort of plug, but actually, yeah, like, you know, do we fill each other's voids that way more often than not? Oh god, I feel like there's a lot of questions in that. Um I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to I'm trying to Can I okay, let me simplify it. Yeah. yeah. Does yeah. like attract like or does opposites attract? What are your thoughts well, on that? Well, certainly opposites attract, but they're not necessarily right for each other long term. And I think, so I think that the, we, so we're attracted to people who get us. Mm. Right. And we're also attracted to people who have an energy that we wish we had more of. Mm. So sometimes, you know, the introvert will be really attracted to the extrovert and vice versa because they're, the energies are so different, it's almost exciting. Mm. But building a life together, I'm not saying it's impossible, but there's going to be challenges to that. Mm -hmm. I'm just using that as an example, the introvert and the extrovert as an example. Great example. Yeah. Um, but, and then we also really are drawn to people romantically and otherwise where we feel where there's similarities, mm. where there's compatibility. Oh yeah. Like you feel like we're in the same tribe. We mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So th that's typically what draws us to other people. So yes, opposites can definitely attract, but, and, and opposites can have an amazing affair, a love affair and a romance, but long-term is it going to be right? Because if you're totally opposite, that means that your natures are really opposite and the things that you love to do are really opposite and the things that you really like to experience are really opposite. That's going to mm -hmm. create challenges for long-term relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Because you have to have, you know, not everything has to be the same, but your natures have to be somewhat aligned. You know, you have to, um, there have to be things that you both really it's like the way that you see the world has to mm -hmm. be somewhat similar. It's very difficult to build a long-term relationship with someone who sees the world through a very, very different lens than you see it. Mm. Again, it doesn't have to, the filter doesn't have to be exactly the same because we want to be in a relationship with someone who challenges us to grow. It's a little bit interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, interesting. And, and also who, who challenges us. Someone who like, you know, like there's a there's a there's a challenge there. 
Um, but fundamentally, it's like if you're see, you know, it's like you look at the world and you're like, I see a blue sky, and someone says, No, I never see a blue sky. I just see the sky red. It's like, how are you going to build a relationship on that? Mm. It's going to be hard. Are there practices for attunement to one another? How do we attune to each other? You mentioned the word attunement a few times yes. in this episode. So, yeah, you know, I, I worked with a couple um, that they were really disconnected emotionally and sexually from one another, but they were, but had in, incredible love for one another. Mm. And they really wanted to learn how to attune to each other better. So mm. like one thing that they would do is like every day they set aside a time, 20 minutes to just completely connect. And the way that they wanted to connect was just like sitting there and, and gazing into each other's eyes and breathing together. And mm. just being totally present with each other. And sometimes it would just be five minutes on a really busy day just to find that connection. So I think that that's really important. I think that attunement, all these things that kind of work in a relationship, uh, rituals are so important. Mm. So some some couples will have the rituals of like every Friday night they go out for dinner or every yeah. Monday, Monday, you know, they have like these, these weekly rituals. Um, some people, the couples, you know, their ritual is every time they come home after a busy day at work, they greet each other, you know, mm. with a hug and a kiss. Or, you know, every night, if they're apart, there's a good night text. So attuning towards one another is really is really fostered by the rituals that a, a couple build and foster. Mm -hmm. inside. And I think rituals are very, very, very powerful. Mm, and quite simple by the sounds of things as well. But again, it's, it's about not easy to install. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's, it's about the commitment and the consistency. I mean, people think that when you commit to another, that what it means is you're not seeing anyone else. Mm. You know, like in the dating world, it's like, okay, well, we're going to commit to each other. That means there's no one else. It's like, no, actually the not sleeping with anyone else is the easy part. The committing to the practices that actually help create a relationship, that's the work. Mm -hmm. That's the commitment. And not everyone is aware of that, that, you know, a lot of people go into relationships thinking it should be easy, or it's just going to be like mom and dad's were, you know, and so we don't realize mm -hmm. that you know, if you if you grew up in a household where your parents were married, you know, married for 40, 50 years and they they're, you know, they're happy, like, you know, you're you're deaf, you're one of those people, their parents didn't get divorced. No, it's not. It's because if you watch and you watch any couple that has lasted a long time and they clearly don't hate each other, they love they're still love. Mm. Well, if you really were to put them in a petri dish and you were to observe them and study them mm. you would see that their much of their relationship is built on ritual wow it's the little things that they do every single day comes back to that point about stress and like the example that like you know the samaritan story it's like we don't stop for the pauses to do the things that we know are innately good for us or good for the other when we're stressed out and time pressured and stuff and this I'm, I'm I'm seeing a picture here. Yeah, it's really yes, putting yes. a picture here. Because yeah. the rituals take a little bit of moment, take us a little bit of slowing down, require us to be a little bit more present, to just engage yes. the way that we would ideally like to. And it's just a matter of affording us the time and space to do that. When we're stressed out and wired, we definitely don't, don't do that. Um, yes. Yeah, we're just yes. sort of, like you said, brought back into it. Like we, we look inward more. We get all self-consumed in our stresses and the rituals sort of dissolve. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> I'm tempted. Exactly. To, I'm tempted to end the podcast there because it's like yeah. a, it's really coming together for me. But you did mention that we didn't cover any work um, on those that are single. Um, I guess at the risk of not diving all the way deep into that space, um, but I guess just to ask you a question from my bare curiosity for those that are single like well i yeah there's a couple of questions actually that i could probably espouse um first one is what do you see in what 
I'm going to use a glucky word here, like the dating market. <laughs> like, what do you see in the world right now? Because Tinder was before my time and I see like just how much like people rely on the digital to build relationships these days amongst each other. And like I've, one of my dearest friends, like she is, yeah, she she has really high standards for herself but yet when she's looking at a screen, she doesn't really get to connect to someone. And I can sort of see that she's basing her judgment on how awesome the human is just by the way they look and not ever having met them. And she's still single and she's still kind of going on that journey. And she really wants to meet someone. So like, is there a short answer to like your sentimentality on kind of what dating and being single in this current world looks like? It's very difficult. If you're on the apps, I I suggest you do not get a texting pal. Don't create a pen pal. Mm. Get on the phone quickly. Mm. And don't go, don't rush to a first date. Get on the phone first because voice is very important. Mm. Whether people realize it or not, you have to hear the other person's voice. You have to see if there's some sort of chemistry or rapport just from the phone call. And you have to just see if, if it feels right. Then you go on a first date. Mm -hmm. um but but get on the call first and if someone and say you know i would really love to like get this off text and just like have a call before we meet and if someone says yeah i'm not really into that don't see them because they're because you're already asking for something that they're declining mm -hmm. so that's never a good yeah. way to start <laughs> you're not asking for something that you're asking for a phone call and someone can't meet that need or isn't on board with that they're already disqualified if I were on the dating apps and, and I were to say, I'd love to just jump on a call before we do a first date, I'm not really into texting. And they gave me some excuse. I would, I would block them. Mm. I wouldn't, there's absolutely no way I'd see them. Mm. So that's, that's really, really important that, um, you know, you can't learn about someone through a text. I don't, I think it's very immature to have long, you know, to have like, to build a relationship or to build some sort of chemistry through text. Don't do that mm -hmm. and get on a phone call before a first date. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people are using these apps um, just for the chemistry that they can then be found and the intimacy that they can then like espouse and not necessarily develop long-term relationships when deep down it sort of feels like long-term relationships is really what, is at the heart of what they desire. Do you find, and I think I've come across some of your work in the past talking about don't jump in the sack too soon, like give yourself some space to sort of, you know, figure out really who this person is and what's going on. Can you describe some of your wisdom around that? Yeah. So particularly for women, most women, um, if they like the person, mm. once they have sex with them, they become attached, we become attached. That is not the same thing for the majority of men. Mm. So would you say it's the inverse for men in some way? Um, I would say that if a man hasn't built an emotional connection mm. with a partner, with the person, let's just let's just say, let's just put this in the heteronormative space. If a man hasn't, because I see this more in that space than okay. I do. Yep. in same-sex relationships um of course it exists in all but i see it most in this so if a man hasn't formed an emotional connection with a woman you know because a man will get very um he'll get overwhelmed with his feelings of attraction mm. and he will really want you know he'll be driven by the need to want to have sex with her which is fine but if he hasn't formed an emotional attachment and he has sex with her, that's the sex is not what's going to solidify the emotional attachment. It could actually even for my research and the, the hundreds of men who I've worked with, it can actually turn them off if they have mm. sex too soon. If there isn't that emotional connection first, hmm. because it's almost like, okay, I, I got that, that sexual tension is gone. I got that out of the way that's not the thing that's going to connect him to her for women. They think a lot of women will think 
well, I have to sleep with him because that's what he wants. And I have to do what it is that he wants, because if I don't, then he's going to find someone else. That is very, very, very misguided. Mm. Um, A man is going to find you 10 times more attractive if you are standing up for what it is that is best for you, Mm -hmm. not the other way around. And um, so I advise a lot of women or people who have any sort of attachment wounding, anxious attachment to wait Mm -hmm. and to really get to know someone first so that you don't, so they don't find themselves in the very unhealthy and anxiety producing dance where they're like, I don't know if we're exclusive. Am I seeing him later? I don't know. And then here she is feeling extremely vulnerable because she slept Mm. with them. And so that's why I say like, if you've been in that experience, wait. And this idea that like, that that a, that a man's not going to want to wait to have sex with you is ridiculous if he likes you he's going to wait a, he'll wait a really long time as long mm. as he's as long as he's reassured that you find him attractive mm. as long as he's reassured that that you are attracted to him mm-hmm. he will wait a really long time for that so i think that um we talked about honesty with oneself you have to be really mm. real with yourself like if you think I'm I'm here to tell you that just because you sleep with someone doesn't mean doesn't make it make you closer to them doesn't mean that they're going to commit to you doesn't mean that they're going to like you more even if you are amazing in bed and mm. you give them the best night sexually they may want to continue to have sex with you but that doesn't mean that that person actually wants to be with you mm. in a relationship so um you know, and this is something that a lot of women have to relearn because culture and society has taught them, you know, to use, they've taught us to use our bodies as sort of weapons. It's like, okay, if you love my body and you love having sex with me, that means you love me. No, not necessarily at all. (sighs) So, um, and that, you know, you really have to no, like if once you have sex, like there's estrogen is the reason why more oxytocin is produced in a menstru- menstruating female, you know, and mm. it's, it's happened for women who are menopausal as well. It's just not as much, which mm. is why a lot of uh, menopausal, postmenopausal women can have uh, can have more like flings and relationships where they're not getting so emotionally involved. It's because of the decline of estrogen. I mean, there's a big hormonal component to this. It's very mm. real. But, you know, if you know that once you share, if you have a beautiful sexual experience with someone and that is going to create attachment in you, there's nothing wrong with you. Like you need to, oh. there's nothing wrong with that. That's very real. But then if that's the case for you, don't have sex until you know there's a mutual emotional connection and that and that there's exclusivity. If you really don't want to be, you don't want to get trapped in that I'm sleeping with this person and I don't know where I stand with them, mm. then don't have sex with them until you know where you stand with them. Mm. Period. Courtship does sound like it looks very different <laughs> than what it did maybe 20, 10, yeah. even 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a beautiful yeah. thing. Mm. And that's what I'm hearing in this is take the time to just appreciate the rituals of courtship. And yeah. And, and, and let's just remove gender from this because I mean, I've spoken to men who are just like, look, I know that. I've been with lots of women who are, who were wrong for me, but because I was so attracted to them, I, it it clouded my vision. Mm. 
Yeah. Chemistry can be a really big fat lie. Chemistry is very, you know, chemistry yeah. is very important. Sets the fireworks off in all the wrong places. Yeah. Chemistry, potentially. Exactly. Potentially. Yeah. Chemistry is very important, but it could also be a really big fat lie. So I think mm. it's important that before things go to that, to that air, that before things be, if you have a pattern of, of a lot of disappointment, falling for the wrong person, things crashing and burning. One thing that you can do to prevent that pattern from, from repeating itself is saying, I'm going to wait until this becomes a sexual relationship. I want to, I want to build the other stuff. That doesn't mean you don't make out. That doesn't mean that there isn't, you know, there isn't um, sort of sensual tension. It just means that you're waiting for it to go there because in the past, when you've gone there really quickly, you ended up getting attached to someone that you were really attracted to who was terrible for you. And Mm -hmm. it ended up being really traumatic for you. So Mm -hmm. guess what? Now is the time to wait and do things differently. Mm. Learning to honor your needs and what is present for you. Yeah. Yeah. And, you, to that. and you, the only way you can honor your needs is to be very honest with yourself about what it is. That <laughs> I love that. Another little question I'd like to tuck in there is I, I see a lot more of people um, evangelizing non monogamous relationships. Is it like whatever comes, take it, eat the cake, however you want to eat it. Like some people like cheesecake, some people like chocolate cake, some people like, you know, banana cake, whatever. Um, Like is there more of a resurgence around non-monogamous relationships in your experience or am I just hearing more about this now because people are trying to normalise it? Your thoughts and sentiments? I, you know, for the people I work with, there hasn't been a rise in this, but I do think that there is a rise in just people just changing the way I think, I think everyone is always looking to figure out how to be happier in relationships. And this mm-hmm. is just what I'm saying. Um, look, whatever works for you, mm-hmm. just don't conform to what someone else wants. Without checking in you with yourself to, first. You have, you have to do, you have to find the person who wants the same thing as you, period. Mm-hmm. And even if the other person is really a person you want to be with, but it doesn't necessarily align to your values and you want to be monogamous. It's no, you're going to, you're facing a lot of pain. You're going to have a lot, a lot of pain. It's not going to work. Some people espouse that pain as an opportunity for growth. Uh, I don't see, no, I mean, you're protecting yourself from trauma. I don't see that as, you know, I think the growth is actually protecting yourself from, from thank you <laughs> for clarifying yeah. that thank yeah. you yeah. and lastly we got a big issue here in australia or well, not a big yeah no it is actually um domestic violence is still a thing um mm-hmm. obviously the, the, there's is like a zero tolerance policy where possible how do you help people sort of have you found some people that have suffered um domestic violence and the sort of key places where they can sort of start to find help navigate those those waters um if you're in an abusive relationship if there's violence of any kind you need to get help maybe you can um there should be like a hotline maybe in in the show notes or whatnot Mm -hmm. um find a therapist tell your family Mm. just there is no if someone if you're in a relationship with someone and they have been physically violent with you, it's going to happen again, no matter Mm. how many times they promise you that it's not going to happen again. It doesn't even matter if they're in therapy, you just need to get out. Mm. There's, there's just, you know, zero tolerance for violence. And so you need to get help. Jillian. I can't thank you enough for your time here today. Seriously, thank you so much for sharing yourself so openly, so abundantly and so richly with us here today. And, you know, if I just thanked you for your time here today, it would be short-sighted. Obviously, it's a lifetime's worth of work and experience that comes into this conversation that we get to revel in today. So thank you so much for you and your work and your walk and really, really, really appreciate you doing this here with us. I appreciate that so much. Thank you for having me. 
Mm, it's an absolute pleasure. And Tribe Inspired Evolution, guys, it, this would not be what it is without you guys either tuning in. So thank you so much for tuning in, being so inspired to evolve. You tuned in all the way to the end of an incredible episode. Um, yeah, yeah, I had I had an amazing time here. Guys, thank you so much for being so inspired to evolve and tuning in and all the best on your relationships going forward. On behalf of myself and the Inspired Evolution Tribe, Jillian, we wish you all the best on your journey forward. Thank you. You too. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like, leave us a comment. And if you want to stay in tune for every, the new episodes launching every Monday, hit subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Stay inspired to evolve.